I probably ought to explain that uh, my background really is, as, as Lonnie uh, suggested, primarily uh, from, from architecture. Um, I'm not a Japan scholar. I don't consider myself a Japan scholar as such, uh, but it is one of my interests and has been for a, for a long time. Uh, but my interest is, is very specific. I'm, I'm concerned with how Japanese buildings relate to human being in general um, and not necessarily how they fit into Japanese culture. So my view is um, somewhat different um, from probably a lot of you and, and also a lot of um, Japan scholars uh, in general. Um, it's, a, it's a function, I suppose, of, of the profession that I'm in, um, that we see ourselves as serving uh, the general public and in particular, um, the public around us, in other words, the, the culture that we are part of. So it's really what what um, what we can learn from Japanese culture and uh, the particular aspect of material culture known as known as architecture that has been a long term interest of mine. So that's the context. Um, so let me jump into this. Um, so this is not self advertising, but uh, it, it's. Um, but it is a book that came out, uh, what, 2004? And it really provides the context of uh, what I wanted to talk to you about this afternoon. Um, and probably three or four years after I published this, maybe a little later, I realized that um, I had the wrong title. Um, probably not the first time that's ever happened to anybody, but uh, it was a more serious problem for me. I felt that um, it was, um, at the time, it seemed perfectly fine, of course, uh, which is why I went ahead and published it. But, uh, but uh, in retrospect, uh, or in hindsight, I felt um, that these were these topics, place, time, and being, were abstractions, and that they were theoretical, and uh, they're the sort of things that philosophers and architects talk about, but they're not the sort of things very often. Um, with the exception perhaps of time, which we none of us have enough of. Um, that's another story. Uh, but they're not the sort of things that, that regular people think about um, very often. And, um, and I realized that it would be more meaningful um, to look at the specifics of, of those general phenomena rather than the generalities. Um, so that's where, um, and I didn't just, Change the title. Um, it really meant a, a complete rethink. Um, so, place, time, and being turned into um, the specific equivalence of those three parameters of existence, I would say. Right? That if you exist, then you are somehow limited by these three dimensions, at least these three that we're aware of. So, they turned into their specific equivalence, right? Um, and here now this, um, and in the process of thinking about that, I realized that all three of those are dictated by the individual human body. So, um, you know, this was a potential title, um, which was very tempting, right, you know, the ambivalence of here, um, but uh, I decided um, for reasons I'll explain in a moment, to go with this, okay, um, literally. Um, this comes before any of the other. Um, this being the human body, or, or any material reality. Um, once something exists, it creates a here, and it actually creates a now, um, especially if it's sentient. So let me try to explain what I mean by that. So our own body then, uh, defines a unique this here and now for each of us. Now, we're pretty used to thinking about that in terms of here, right? Ultimately, each of us has our own here. So, you know, when, when I call out, you know, attendance, when we used to do that kind of thing and when we used to have classes in person, um, you know, most people, unless they're trying to be smart, you know, will say, here, as opposed to, well, actually, I'm here, but, you know, it's a different here from yours, right? Um, I'll talk about the way architecture affects that, but 
that's the conventional of the three, the most um, conventional, the one that we're most used to. This, well, think about it in terms of um, the way I usually explain this is, uh, if I handed you my pencil, like it's in my hand now, so it's this pencil to me. For all of you, of course, it's that pencil. If somehow I were able to reach through the screen and hand this to you, um, then as you took it from me, it would transition magically from a, for me, from a this to a that. And when we were both holding it, when we were actually in the process of exchanging it, we would actually both be able to say, it's a this. Physical contact with the body turns a that to a, to a this. So, but the ultimate of this is the this of our body. That's the first and original this, just as it is the first and ultimate here. Now, um, probably a little less intuitive to understand that, but if you think about it, uh, the sound of my voice or whatever other sounds you're hearing, uh, the sound waves that are entering your ear and affecting your eardrum are unique to you. So we all will hear uh, a unique set of phenomena. Uh, so, and it's really our sensing of the world around us that creates the, the sensation of now. So to that extent, now is individual for all of us and it depends, it's unique for every separate body for all of us. So that was a big kind of realization. It may be obvious to other people, but and it's obvious to me now, but it was a big revelation to me. Um, metaphors and analogies between buildings and bodies have been made for a long time, but this seemed to be somewhat different to me. Um, and it was directly relevant to Japan. You may be wondering, is he ever going to talk about Japan? Uh, um, I know. Um, so uh, you've all seen signs like this, right, um, on maps, etc. cetera. Um, but hopefully you've understood that I mean, literally, you are here. Right? You create your own here. Um, I'm not sure if John Lennon meant that, but I'll, I'll take that. Um, but you are also now, you create now through the senses that your body is, your particular, your unique embodiment is, is sensing. And yes, you are also this. Okay. You create this, you can convert an object into a this by contact with your body. Yeah. Um, I would have to disagree with John on this one. Right? He says, this is not here. I'm not entirely sure. We've never had a conversation about what he meant by that. But I would argue that, um, that this here and now are all centered on the body. For all I know, he might have meant something similar. So, um, to Japan, or at least via Japan. But we will come back to, to this culture and to today. But I'm gonna look primarily at traditional Japanese buildings. So, um, this would be commonly understood, um, certainly in English, as uh, a unique thing, you know, this, this pencil. And many of you, I'm sure, most, if not all of you, would be very aware of Shintai, um, sacred bodies of kami, spirits, um, that were recognized, or their presence, or their activity was recognized uh, by a very um, um, primitive, in the best sense of the word, tectonic act, the act of wrapping. Right? Enclosure of space is what architects do. It's what architectures do. And so this weaving and um, enclosure of space is is a very pure form of, of architecture. It doesn't look like a building, but it is. It's, uh, um, but it significantly is marking a Shintai, a sacred body. Hope you see the connection, right? So this is perceived, uh, was perceived, still is to some degree, um, as the embodiment, right? The temporary embodiment of a, of a spirit, a kami. Right? And it's this is being acknowledged, right? that it's peculiar. This happens to be um, a rock in a harbor in 
kind of that is rewrapped with this enormous by the way a person would probably be this is a seagull um a person might be um well, let me tell you that the rope is probably at least 12 inches, probably more like 15 inches in diameter. So it takes you know, a very large number of, of guys to, to, to rewrap this. It's just been rewrapped. I watched the festival. But my message here then is, or my point is, that this is a sacred body. It's a this that has been, um, and, a, and a here, right, that has been celebrated. And that celebration, of course, is a celebration of now, but we'll get to that. Here's another example. And again, these will be very familiar to, to most of you. Okay. So a peculiar materiality has been acknowledged. Right? Primarily, um, I assume, out of an abundance of caution, right? but this is a powerful spirit. Um, we ought not to offend it. Um, we should try to appease it. So, um, and the Shimon Aladdin, is, as far as I understand it, both a message to mortals to stay away and treat this with respect, but also a message to the kami that, okay, we're giving you your own space. It didn't just extend to um, the bodies of kami that had departed or temporarily abided. Also, um, as you all know, right, the Yokozuna, the grand champion, is ceremony wrapped in uh, in his own Shiminawa. Okay. So I think the connection with the notion of the body, right, um, an embodiment of a powerful, exceptional spirit, um, I think it's very clear. Somewhat of a leap, but I hopefully I can convince you that there's a connection. Um, in the tea ceremony as it developed the Wabi form of tea in the uh, 15th century, late 15th century then, um, as you all know then, Korean tea bowls, um, humble, sorry, Korean rice bowls, um, kind of ordinary um, but very idiosyncratic uh, uh, forms were highly prized by Japanese tea masters because of their uniqueness, right? The, the, the craftspeople who had made them, you know, they were mass producing these by handmade and they were flawed, right? um, not deliberately, but if you, you know, you couldn't reproduce two perfect rice bowls by hand if you tried, right? Um, and they were, they were in a hurry. They weren't, you know, spending time making these for tea masters, you know, these were rice bowls in many cases. So, so, but that became, as you all know, uh, uh, price, you know, the, that uniqueness, that idiosyncrasy. Again, we have that sensitivity to unique materiality that this cannot be created again. It, it's inherently unique. And that speaks to me, and I think it did to the, to the, to the tea masters, uh, uh, as a reminder that it's all unique. My pencil is unique. You're unique. We all are. Every materiality, every being is actually unique. Now they don't all um, make that obvious, um, but the great thing about these utensils is that they do, right? That they are um, unrepeatable. Right? So I think there's a huge message there. And even though the tea room is not usually associated with Shinto, I think that sensitivity, in, in, even though it's primarily Zen, of course, that sensitivity to the uniqueness of materialities, all materialities, including our own, I think is an important continuity between those two traditions. So again, as you will know then, um, each utensil is intended to be representative of one color, one form, um, no repetition, again, uniqueness, uh, it's being emphasized. And for each gathering, because it is a unique gathering, this one event, um, you would not usually um, repeat the same collection of tea utensils. So this celebration of the uniqueness of being takes many forms, not only the unique utensils, but the unique collection, the, the unique gathering of utensils as an expression of the uniqueness of the gathering. So 
unique locations. Um, so here we are again. Um, I've forgotten which four. I think it's Ono Falls up in Nagano. This is uh, by Hiroshige. Um, but again, it's being marked. And it's not so much the materiality, because of course, in this case, uh, famously, right, the, the river is not the same river, right? But it's the location, right? This is a mark, this is marking a, a distinct location. And more familiarly, so if you imagine, um, you know, there is theoretically a point, right? The, the, a fixed point. This tree isn't going anywhere, right? Um, so I'm not sure, in fact, I'm, I'm not at all sure um, that this is the way that they're thought of um, in Japan. But if you can imagine that um, these are, um, there's a, there's a, theoretically, there's an axis running through these, right? That these are fixed objects, fixed locations. And that kind of idea, the landmark, uh, of course, transcends culture, right? That would have been how our distant ancestors in Japan, anywhere in, in Hawaii, would have navigated. That's how we found our way around. We still do, right? That certain things in the environment need to be fixed. So um, fixed objects are in, in, a, in an otherwise confusing and threatening uh, environment would have been enormously important. And I think this is one manifestation of it. So the Shimanawa and the sacred trees, not only were they acknowledging the presence of the kami, but they were also um, making places. Right? They were recognizable places in an otherwise hostile and confusing environment. So that gets transferred, the, the, the Shimboku, the, the sacred tree trunk gets transferred in multiple ways into Japanese architecture. Um, so I'll show you a slide in a moment that kind of summarizes this, but uh, from the Honden in the uh, Shinto shrine to the pagoda, which is a unique pagoda. You know, this is very different from the Chinese pagoda, which usually or often has the staircase, right? This one has sacred column, right? Um, now different function, but, but that um, tree trunk in various forms, now it's been detached from its roots, but that tree trunk is literally and metaphorically central to a great deal of traditional Japanese architecture, um, including, of course, um, the Wabi Tea Room. Here's the Nakamashira. And um, this is a twofer, right? It's not only marking a unique location, um, but also it is a unique materiality, right? You can't replicate this particular tree. You can't go off and grow an identical tree. You just can't do it. And that's part of its message that uh, materiality is inherently unique and therefore valuable. Right? It's all valuable because you can't repeat it. Um, that, of course, gets transferred into the domestic uh, interior, the Sakiya style interior. Now, here's the Tokobashira, which is again it's a, not only a unique materiality, which is a reflection of, of course, the owner of, of, of the building, of the house. Um, they chose that. They selected that, it's, it's part of their taste, but also it, it actually marks a fixed point, right? a fixed location. So here's that slide I was um, mentioning. So if we go from top left, um, and I'm not suggesting that this is necessarily um, the sequence in which this evolution happened, that has been lost to history as far as I'm aware. But we start with the sacred tree uh, wrapped by a Shimanawa, the Shinboku. Um, soon after that, a Kekai, uh, a sacred precinct, is created around the sacred tree, which might well still have a Shimanawa around it. Um, and that Kekai usually is one that humans, mortals, are not allowed into, unless um, on two occasions, right, either a, a festival or a, um, or a priest perhaps might be allowed to share that sacred precinct. And that's enormously important. Uh, the, the architectural historian Teiji Ito um, argued that that was really um, the beginning of Japanese architecture, where human beings start to occupy the sacred precinct. Because of course, uh, being close to the sacred, if, you, if we believe Eliade in the sacred and profane, right, human beings everywhere want to be close to the sacred. It's a form of protection. Um, so um, dwelling within the sacred precinct, right, 
would have been a, a natural motive. So then moving to this, uh, uh, this is the, a version of the Himurogi, the, the temporary Shinto shrine. Um, and um, in this case, then only for some kind of land occupation. Usually in these days, um, that would be um, construction of a building, but if agricultural um, use of land as well. And then the shrine san sanctuary, the, the Honden, right? And again, in this case, only priests would have been allowed to share that sacred space. It's sort of in between the body of the kami and profane space out here. So this space in between is, it's special, um, it's sacred, but you know, it's not the actual body of the kami. So this space uh, becomes enormously significant. And eventually, according to Teiji Ito, and I think he was right, it gets occupied in the form of the tea room and in the domestic uh, space, the four posted um, of the uh, of the Japanese um, traditional building. So, um, but again, we have in a smaller version, right? We have the Nakabashira and the Tokubashira. So the, the, the marking of a specific here, a specific location, and usually with uh, the remnants of a sacred tree are there throughout. Now, I'm not arguing that this is the way that the Japanese themselves think about that, right? I'm talking as an outsider, but this is how I see it. Um, so unique events. So uh, everybody would be familiar with Shide and um, they have several roles, but one of their roles, uh, I would argue, is to indicate the coming and going of spirits that are invisible. This is an early form of motion detector. So how else can you tell whether a kami is here or there or nowhere, um, unless you have some indicator. Right? And as you all know, uh, kami were synonymous with the wind, right? another invisible, mysterious, invisible force. So the presence of the wind meant the presence of kami, the coming and going of kami. And here's the Himarogi in a more familiar form. And of course, uh, not only did it have shide, surrounding or hung from the Shimanawa, um, but also the Sakaki branch. Right? Um, as I understand it, the shaking of the leaves of the Sakaki branch would be an indicator to the Shinto priest um, that the land kami had arrived or departed. And then back to the tea room and um, the ceremony. Um, this is rather a small tea room. It's in the Ashmolean in in Oxford, the other place. Um, um, but as you will know then, um, famously, this is a celebration of now, of here and now, presence. Okay. Um, we'll be tied anybody who brings a watch or God forbid a cell phone into a tea ceremony. Right? You're, you're supposed to be paying attention to this experience and sharing that with your fellow guests and, and the host. And um, so as this, Famous then saying goes, Ichigo Ichie, one time, one meeting. This can't be repeated. This is a one off. And that, of course, is the nature of, um, of being, of existence. It's a one way, as far as we know, at least as far as I know, it's a one way trip and you don't get to do it over. Um, you know, so each of these mundane moments and what could possibly be more mundane than making tea and sharing it for two hours. Okay. But of course, the the message there was even the most mundane things that we take for granted are special and there will be a time there was a time where we were not capable of doing them and that another time will come you know in the future when we're not capable so all of this even the most mundane activities of life should be uh, are, are inherently um, valuable because they are unique and unrepeated so in a way, you could think of the tea room as something like this. Right? Outside, um, time goes on, or at least the illusion of time. Right? Um, things have happened in what we um, fancifully call the past, and things may or may not happen in what we imagine to be the future. But of course, neither of those really exist. They are constructions of our 
of our own minds, right? The only place where we can actually exist is that, right? Um, so now I don't know that the tea masters themselves thought of the tea room this way, but I think it's, a, it's one way to understand um, the way that, that it functioned as a kind of, I don't, most of you would not be um, uh, familiar with Doctor Who. Uh, I'm aging myself and, um, and locating myself culturally as well. But the TARDIS, and you have to look it up, it's a blue police box, uh, um, T-A-R-D-I-S, um, uh, would have been the equivalent, right? It, it, it was a time machine, right? Um, and um, time flowed as normal outside of it, but within it, time stopped. And that's the way I think of, um, of the tea room. Not a great analogy, but it just came to me now. So um, Okakura Tenshin, um, you will be familiar with, um, says something in um, the famous Book of Tea along the lines of, um, Chinese Taoists, um, or Chinese historians, um, spoke of Taoism as, um, as the art of life. Um, and he said something along the lines of, because it deals with the present. Okay, but then he goes dot 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 ourselves, and it is, I believe, I'm paraphrasing here. It's in ourselves, it's in us that um, tomorrow parts from yesterday. So um, again, back to the body, right? Uh, um, the notion or the analogy between the body and and the building, um, and, and back to what I was saying at the beginning um, that we embody. Um, or we create this here and now, or temporarily, uh, absolutely, right? Um, we carry memories of, of the past. They're all, you know, some of them are shared, but most of them are, are personal, right? And we have uh, ideas about what may or may not happen in the future, um, but it's our physical being right? and our minds um, that carry that through time, okay? So, so in that respect, um, we are the present. And um, I'm very fond of that term because of its ambivalence in English, at least. Uh, um, uh, you know, not only are we here, but we are now. Okay. Um, so as we move through time, you know, we are the interface between the past and the future, each of us. Back to the domestic interior, the, uh, the washitsu. Then, as you all absolutely know, um, famously flexible, open space. Uh, it can be adjusted uh, with different furnishings, of course, but also adjusted, uh, as we see on the right, according to the particular needs of the occupants. Right? So it uh, can be minutely adjusted um, if it's a little bit too breezy, where well, you close the shogi a bit. If the sun is too strong, you bring the sudari down. Um, if the bugs are around, there are amido for that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, between all of these screens, it is a very finely tunable system. Um, but it it's a bit. I'm not a sailor, but it's a bit like what I imagine a sailing boat to be like. The human being, the sailor, is a critical part of this system. That's the person who pulls the rope or doesn't, or lets the rope out or doesn't. Right? And it's the same with the washitsu, that um, there's a human actor in all of this that um, not only decides when, in, when to open or close a different screen or move a piece of movable furniture, um, but also um, physically does that, right? uses their body to do it. And in the process of doing that, um, um, they affirm their presence. Now, you know, again, they're not thinking about that, but if you, if you imagine, um, if you're the only person in that space and you get up and you open the shoji, well, that shoji is not gonna move by itself. So you have affirmed your presence, right? Your physical presence. It, it took your energy and your muscles and your presence to, to make that change in your environment. And, and that's one way that we interact with the environment um, to affirm our presence. Um, the other way is if you're sat 
in that bottom right room and you're seeing the wind, listening to the birds, right? Sensing, right? The environment and change in that environment is also, it's the other way, right? The inverse, where the environment is changing us, right? It's stimulating us. Um, so there are two ways. It's a two-way interaction. We can change the environment and the environment can change us through us sensing change in the, uh, through our senses. But they both make us present. They both make us aware of now. And um, the one thing I'd forgotten here is, of course, that um, the Washitsu is, amongst architects, sort of, um, famously known as flexible, adjustable space. Um, and it is, but it's not responsive to time, which is a common mistake in my view, and one that I've made myself. Um, and it's possibly not even responsive to change, although you could say, well, you know, when the wind gets up outside, then somebody closes the shoji. But the shoji don't move by themselves, as I just explained. Somebody has to. So in other words, um, I see this as responsive to the present. And the present is whoever happens to be in that room and decides it's too cold in here or it's too warm. Right? Again, the human actor, the body, right, is central to this in deciding um, um, I'm too cold or I'm too warm, and then acting, physically moving parts of what I would say is an extended body, the building. Right? Um, so in architecture, it's quite common to talk of the third skin. Well, you all know what the first one is, the second one is clothing, the third one is architecture. Right? So you know, we can take layers off, and that's very common, of course, in traditional Japanese buildings, and highly necessary, right? because they weren't particularly well heated. Um, but the third skin is, is that of the building. So um, we ourselves, you know, the occupants of the building, um, are, could be seen as the present and, um, or the space. And um, this, this form, uh, traditional Japanese building form with all of its movable parts, I see as being responsive to the present rather than to change. It's responsive to the occupants, and the occupants are the ones who sense that it's too cold or too warm. Okay. It may seem like a pedantic differentiation, but I think it's important. It begins again with the human body and the change itself, sensing you know, that they're too warm or too cold, but then um, it's through the human body that the changes are, are made. That's very different from uh, some kind of thermostat uh, automatically making the change. And I may or may not have time to talk about the consequences of that, but I think it makes a big difference right? when you physically get up and act and make the change. Right? It's not the same when it happens ultimately. So um, how, is, how does any of this relate to, you know, most of us don't uh, occupy um, medieval Japanese buildings, right? Exactly. Right? So how does this, relate to here and now in the sense of um, contemporary buildings, not necessarily in Japan, but also in Japan. So it's a big jump, I know, but um, this kind of, this is a, uh, an adobe wall, so it's rammed earth. Right? And uh, you couldn't make two identical rammed earth walls if you tried, right? It's, it's, a, you know, it's an uncontrollable process. Right? Uh, very different from mass producing sheetrock out of a factory. Right? Although if you went to Home Depot, right, I suggest you don't do this at Home Depot, but you could, and really examined each piece of sheetrock, you would notice that they all are different. But of course, in the factory, there's probably somebody going around who is there for quality control. And the objective of quality control, of course, is to make tens of thousands of identical products. Well, the tea masters probably would have not only been puzzled by that, but also probably think, yeah, that's, that's a pretty nonsensical objective, right? Because it's impossible. Right? Materiality is inherently unique. You can't make two identical, even if you bought, you know, two Ferraris, most of us can't afford to buy one, right? They're not gonna be identical. 
right? Now, superficially, they look that way. What we're looking at here, though, is there's no attempt to make something the same. It's very de de um, deliberately idiosyncratic. It's very deliberately unique. Now, my argument is that all being is unique. That chair looks like it would have been mass produced, right? But actually, they're all unique. And, but the wall seems far more interesting, right? Because, uh, and somebody probably paid a lot of money. They could have had that done in cheaper, but they chose to have it done that way. And each, you know, they, they have other walls, but they're going to be different. Right? Each layer of this is different. And to me, and perhaps I've just been looking at this stuff for too long, that says something about all being, including our own. Um, that it is all inherently unique. And some of it is self-evidently unique, like this Adobe wall, but a lot of it doesn't actually send that message. But when it does, it, I think, um, is affirming right? that it's all important inherently because it can't be replicated. So objects, and particularly built-in built objects, fixed objects, so we go back to the tree, right? The sacred shimbo, um, uh, rooted, um, and then that getting transferred into various architectural spaces. But at each, I believe, in each case, be it the tea room or the ski style, um, uh, the honden of the, of the shrine or the pagoda, it's a fixed point, okay? uh, more or less fixed object. And that helps to affirm where we are. And that we still, I believe, take respite or um, um, solace out of, that's the right word, um, or out of more mundane level, orientation from fixed objects. Now, there are some out in the landscape, but it can be very helpful if they're also in the in the building. So if think go back to the Washington, um, famously empty, right? Nothing is fixed. It's the it's the ukiyo, right? It's the floating world. Except within that floating world of um, zabuton and tables and things that can get shifted at a moment, right? You wouldn't dream of it. You're not going to say, well, let's move the, the tokobashi. Right? It's the one kind of fixed object. Right? It's the center. And I think it goes back to the, to the sacred Shimboku. But I don't think it's, you know, clearly that is a unique cultural expression, unique to the Japanese. But um, this need for an appreciation of fixed objects in our life, and particularly in places that we spend more than 90% of our lives indoors. And that was true long before COVID, by the way. Um, you know, we live indoors these days, basically, even though we're outdoor creatures. So bringing the tree indoors was, was, a, was a profound, um, was a fixed object indoors then. It was a profound move, right? um, because it provides this fixed location. And we all need that, that center. Right? Um, my former teacher, David Brock, um, long past, but, um, but he described a typical day in the life of a human being as a sort of spiraling right? um, from uh, the place that we sleep when we go out in the world and we have our lives and our being and we meet people and then we come back. But well, we used to do that before COVID, of course. Now I just hover between my kitchen and my living room, but, uh, but in a normal life, right? So you know, we could describe, but, we, you, but then we come back. Um, and in most contemporary houses, you know, the center that we come back to is our pillow. But it's not very fixed, right? You know, you can pick it up, you can put it in the wash, right? Um, a lot of our built environments, domestic environments included, um, don't really have fixed centers. And I think that still is a need for human beings. You know, we're very different, right? We think of ourselves as much more sophisticated than our ancestors, but the reality is that we share more with our ancestors than we would care to admit. Um, so finally then, um, any change, either change on the left that we make in the world, when we, when we open up these uh, great big door come window panels, and this is a Tom Kundig house up in Washington, right? Physically, 
um, we are really proving that we are present. That's not going to happen by itself. Okay. Um, but so that's us operating, changing our environment and affirming our presence. But then on the right hand side, we see the effects of wind on water and the sun shining through that into a building happens to be a new pattern by the way, it's in Kimeji. Um, but both of these phenomena, when we physically with our own bodies change the environment or the environment changes us by us seeing change or hearing change, sensing, um, they make us present. And these things can be built into architecture or overlooked. And of course, I would prefer that they be built into architecture because I think they still matter. So, uh, the phenomenologists who uh, I've been reading probably in the last five years only, I'm kind of late to the game. Um, they, Asherol in particular, um, and his assistant, uh, Edith Stein, um, uh, who died, I believe, in a concentration camp. Um, but she, before that, had done her dissertation on um, the problem that Asherol had had brought up um, that uh, we experience the world through our senses and our senses are inherently subjective. They're based on the individual body. So how then, he asked, can we share anything if we're all embodied in these separate bags of bones called bodies? How can we, how can we possibly share any experiences with others? We are, we're inevitably separated, right? There's a barrier between us. Um, um, and that goal, um, he, he termed intersubjectivity. Now that's been used in lots of other fields since then, but that was the original. And Edith Stein um, uh, suggested empathy is, is a profound way that we can share experiences. And, and that's true. And, and I think Merle Ponte talked about physical relationships um, um, as another means, you know, it's closest that we can share experiences with another human being. But um, I happen to think, and I'm a little biased here, that architecture has a role, and probably you've been reading what I've been prattling on here. Um, so uh, if we share, going back to my pencil, if we share contact with an object, a physical object, it is this for both of us. Well, um, most of us stand on the floor inside buildings, I hope, unless you're Spider-Man. Um, most of us, well, at home, I don't wear my shoes. Right? That's too long in Japan, but I believe that's true in a lot of houses in Hawaii. Right? Um, so uh, if you were in stocking feet or bare feet, um, then you really are bodily in contact with the same object. It's effectively the same this. And that's somewhat different if you've got your shoes and socks on and you're sat on a chair and somebody else is sat on a chair. So I would say sitting on the floor or sitting on a bench places us much more in a position where we can share this. Okay. So architecture has a role. Um, the platform is one of the fundamental um, elements, architectural elements, one of the first right, to raise the floor. So is enclosure, the, the one in the middle, right? um, the enclosure of space. And I go back to my um, uh, example of calling attendance. Right? If you're in a room and you say, you know, you read out some student's name and they will, they used to, this is kind of old school, I don't think they do this anymore, but I used to say here, okay? Well, the assumption is that my here is the same as the instructor's here. It's not, technically it's not, but because we are in the same enclosure created by architecture, then we can understand that, well, yes, that we are sharing a here. You know, that's taken for granted and yet, the implication is because here is determined by the body. Oh, we're sharing a body. Oh, strange. Um, and then the last example, um, and it could be anything. It happens to be uh, a hearth. Again, one of the earliest, uh, all three of these, right? The, the platform, the enclosure, and the hearth are three of Gottfried Semper, a German architectural theorists, um, four elements of architecture. The other one was the roof, uh, but so three of the four here. Right? So these are not new, these are not inventions. These are as old as architecture. And the oldest element of architecture, according to Semper, was the heart, right? 
before anything, people gather around the hearth. And then, according to his argument, they created the other elements, the platform and the enclosure, to keep the flame alive. Human beings got shelter and warmth afterwards, but the first thing was, don't let the fire go out. So um, hopefully you can, you have read the labels here and you'll see where I'm going with this, that, that architecture is capable, and it's one of the few things that is capable of helping us effectively share what are otherwise inherently subjective, individual, personal experiences, this, here, now, that are usually determined um, by our separate bodies. And the implication of that is, um, and here's a traditional Japanese example, but the implication of that is that buildings are a form of extension of the body, but critically, they're cohabitable. And that makes a big difference. Um, thank you very much for your time.